Apparently, the evangelical church loves the smell of trash. Jesus volunteered to go to hell. Strike and strike and strike. There's one thing that even Jesus can't do. Even Jesus cannot override your unbelief. And strike and strike and strike. Peter, James, Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith. We must as well. And strike and strike and strike and strike. There is a tone in evangelical Christianity these days that says, be nice. Hey, there's just some Christians. They've got different understanding of things than you. So just be nice. And of course, to a degree, that's true. We've got varying shades and stripes on non-essential issues. That's not what Spurgeon is concerned about. Oh, if some of you were like your fathers, who would not have tolerated in this age the wagon loads of trash under which the gospel has been of late buried by ministers of your own choosing. The prince of preachers warning, hey, false teachers who change the gospel, who define God wrongly, they lead to destruction eternally and temporally. Jesus became an inventor of evil. Jesus became lost. Jesus became a hater of God. Jesus became Satan worship. Jesus became every lustful thought. Jesus became child Jesus became Jesus became Jesus became If we are really going to be nice, there are going to be times when we identify a false teacher who's burying the gospel under wagon loads of trash and say, hey, that's wrong. Even though Jesus was fully God, he completely laid down his divinity when he was on this earth, completely, so that he could be fully human. And warn the followers of a false teacher because that wolf is devouring people. Omnipotent. Father. Does that mean that we are supposed to be obnoxious, condescending jerks? No. It happens to be one of my spiritual gifts, but I have to deny that desire and lovingly, sometimes forcefully, call out false teachers. First of all, I believe the, the man uh, is a false teacher. I believe he's a, a heretic. Who is our role model for this? I say it is Jesus Christ himself. But you're thinking about your Gospels, that Jesus spoke severely to the Pharisees. Hmm. Was he not being nice? No, he was being nice by telling them the truth, even sharply, rightly motivated by love. Perhaps you think, well, no, wait a second, he turned over the tables in the marketplace. He did. Why? Because they were producing a false system, a false way to earn your way to heaven, to buy God's pleasure with you. In other words, they were being false teachers in the marketplace, and Jesus was being nice by turning over that system. I'm talking about now prosperity. These people who are teaching falsely are hurting families, they're wrecking churches, and they're burying the gospel under wagon loads of trash from Charles Spurgeon. I cannot endure false doctrine, however neatly it may be put before me. Would you have me eat poison meat because the dish is of the choicest ware? It makes me indignant when I hear another gospel put before the people with enticing words by men who would fain make merchandise of souls. And I marvel at those who have soft words for such deceivers. Is it possible you've been too soft on false teaching and false teachers? Perhaps you have bought the zeitgeist of the time that tells us, hey, be, be nice, be, be soft, don't be judgmental. That, that's postmodernism that perhaps has invaded your Christian worldview and understanding of your responsibility to defend the truth once given for all time. From a Charles Spurgeon, I would to God we had all more of such decision, for the lack of it is depriving our religious life of its backbone and substituting for honest manliness a mass of tremulous jelly of mutual flattery. There is more to Christian orthodoxy than just saying you love the gospel or that you give a thumbs up to Jesus. Why does the Bible contain 
so much theology if it's not important. The New Testament is loaded with theology. And the Christian who says, well, just not a big deal, perhaps has not been reading the New Testament with an eye on the importance of theology. Back to Spurgeon, he said, he who does not hate the false does not love the true. And he to whom it is all the same, whether it be God's word or man's word, is himself unrenewed at heart. Charles Spurgeon stating, if you do not distinguish between true and false and make an effort to draw a line and to separate from and to mark those who cause division, he's actually accusing you of not being a Christian yourself. John 10 comes to mind. These are strong words, not from Spurgeon, but from Jesus. He's talking about wolves in sheep's clothing, false teachers who are masquerading as angels of light, who come to do the devil's work by lying in order to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus warns, if you as a shepherd, in other words, as a pastor, do not raise your voice to warn the sheep of wolves, you're not a shepherd yourself. Caveat before somebody goes off the rails and becomes the king or queen of discernment. It is now my ministry to identify every false statement every line that has been carelessly uttered, every pastor who's ever preached anything, I just don't think measures up to my standard. That is way wrong. That is the opposite ditch. I would even go a step further that a ministry that is dedicated to nothing but calling out false teachers would do well to examine itself to make sure it is not in an unbiblical ditch. Back to Spurgeon. You would have hurled out of your pulpits the men who are enemies to the fundamental doctrines of your churches and yet are crafty enough to become your pastors and undermine the faith of a fickle and superficial generation. Not nice? No, that is being nice on every single level. There are pastors who are willing to masquerade as a true messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ who aren't. Praying with me now, Mother God, Creator God, loving God, holy God. Even if they aren't goofing up on the gospel, they are not presenting theology in such a way that it feeds the sheep and brings God's people joy. Because if a preacher is watering it down, I'm not even talking about heresy. I'm just talking about, hey, kind of just let's just shave off some of those sharp edges. Let's sandpaper some of those rough spots that we think are going to be offensive. They will not be presenting God's word in its fullness and then people will not have the fullness of joy. Is it nice to give them a pass from Charles Spurgeon. These men steal the pulpits of once Orthodox churches. Oh, don't they? Because otherwise they would have none at all. Their powerless theology cannot of itself arouse sufficient enthusiasm to enable them to build a mousetrap at the expense of their admirers. And therefore they profane the houses which your sires have built for the preaching of the gospel and turn aside the organizations of once orthodox communities to help their infidelity. Anybody else thinking of so many of the mainline Protestant denominations? In some parts of Christianity we have turned salvation into a work that you have to say I claim Jesus is my Lord and Savior in order to be saved. That turns it into a work. It denies the possibility of grace. Prepare yourself for some more kidney punches from Charles Spurgeon. Perhaps we're in the other ditch where we fraternize with false teachers. From Charles Spurgeon, I beg the Lord to give back to the churches such a love to his truth that they may discern the spirits and cast out those which are not of God. Love of the truth defends the truth. Do you defend your spouse? If somebody you love is being assaulted, do you not jump in to defend the one you love? If that is true, why are we defending the truth if we love it? 
any religious leader who speaks the word of God, who has more than one suit, while someone has no clothes, is a cop out. Yeah, you know, Larry, I just don't see it that way. More from the Prince of Preachers. There are some with whom we should have no fellowship, nay, not so much as to eat bread. Let's define some. Does this mean you never fellowship with people who don't agree with you on every jot and tittle? Absolutely not. We are together in Christ because our differences are secondary and tertiary, and too often these days, I see people who used to fellowship with one another who are theologically in lockstep, but they discover one little thing or somebody doesn't agree with them and how we're supposed to respond to a social issue and bang, 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 let the circular firing squad commence. What happened to the sweet fellowship that we would have and that Paul warns us to have in 1 Corinthians. He's all about sectarianism, denouncing it. Hey, you say, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos. What, are you kidding me? Did, any, did we save you? No, Jesus, you're of Christ. We should have fellowship with one another, love one another, quit sniping at one another over non-essential, unimportant things, especially in such an unloving way. It is grieving me lately to see people this is, this is so typical. You know, I've really loved this guy for years. Seen him at conferences. Wow, he's been such a blessing to evangelical Christianity. You know what's coming. But he just said something I disagree with. So pow, 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 pow. wrong application of 2 John. We break fellowship not with somebody with whom you have a secondary, tertiary, what would be a fourthly, a fourth level, of a quarter, quarterly objection. No, we love one another. We don't fellowship, however, with false teachers who are wonky on the essentials. You know, when they were fighting me about them jets, my lady said he has four jets. Well, I've never owned four jets at one time, but they gave me an idea. Why not? Delta's got more than four. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching. I can feel, I can feel that pushback. We want the new you, the free you, the redeemed you, the blessed you, the confident you, the victorious you. <laughs> you know, for all the good stuff. Amen. Man. Yeah, you got favor on you. Increase in favor. If we love the truth, if we love the brethren, if we love false teachers, and if we love Jesus, we will not fraternize with those who make trash out of the gospel. We will lovingly and nicely warn them and their followers. Welcome to Delphi, South Africa. Please do not let these delightful images deceive you. Delphi is a rough and tumble town. Gang violence, criminality, prostitution, and yet the Tomorrow Clubs led by a former gang member leading the little children to Jesus for the whopping cost of $1 per child per month. Please consider supporting Tomorrow Clubs, tomorrowclubs.org slash wretched.